There are a variety of terms that are being used at the moment. Euthanasia is the more traditional one. It just means a good death. Um, assisted suicide, helping someone to commit suicide for whatever reason they might want to do that. Assisted dying implies that the person has a terminal illness, that they are in the process of dying anyway, so they're being helped along a natural course. So something more stringent than assisted suicide. Sometimes people also want to add the word voluntary to these terms. Obviously, if they're involuntary, it's murder. Uh, and another distinction that can be useful is between physician-assisted forms of euthanasia. Uh, there are various ways, various forms of the assistedness of assisted suicide, assisted dying. This may come into our debate later on. The finding was this from the research we did this January. A very, very um, strong majority of people wanting the law to be changed. We also um, looked specifically in our survey at religious people. By adherence, that just means people who, when they're asked, they identify as being Anglican or Catholic or Buddhist or whatever, but not as no religion. They also, surprisingly, uh, a, a significant margin there also supporting a change in the law amongst religious people in Great Britain as a whole, adults in Great Britain as a whole. I'm sorry that's a bit small at the top, but I wanted to get all the religions in. Um, you can see there is, a, there is some variation between the different religious traditions. Um, this is all up on our website um, for you to look at in more detail. We asked also about reasons. So we're very interested in why people are saying that they want a change in the law or that they don't want a change in the law. So the way the poll worked, first of all, we just asked, do you want to change, yes or no? And then if you said that you did want to change, what were your reasons? And astonishing um, support for that first reason. As you can see, they aren't exclusive. You can tick as many as you like. But 82% of people saying their reason for thinking the law should be changed is that an individual has the right to choose when and how to die. And then a worry about drawn-out suffering uh, is the next largest. But... It, very significant consensus in attitudes, reasoning there. And amongst those who don't want to see a change in the law, don't want to see uh, it becoming more permissive, less consensus about the reasons here. And interestingly, um, the reason that campaigners often talk about, particularly religious ones, human life is sacred, is, uh, comes only fourth in the reasons. The, the most significant worry is that vulnerable people could feel pressurised or be pressurised to die. I support legislating to allow assisted dying. Linda gave very clear definitions and of what is meant by assisted dying, both in Linda's book and in my book, is that means assisting somebody to take their own life, but in the context of a terminal illness. I am motivated to support this by my experience of seeing how people die and listening to people explaining what their experience of the death of a loved one has been. So the director of public prosecutions, the person who decides whether you're prosecuted or not, has issued guidelines which say, in effect, I won't prosecute people if they're motivated by compassion. But these guidelines make it clear that he would prosecute a doctor if he assisted somebody to commit suicide. So you have this ridiculous, hypocritical law which says amateur assistance in this country is allowed, but professional assistance is not. It is a ridiculous denial of the facts. Can you introduce a law, or do you have to depend upon the discretion of the Director of Public Prosecutions? I think you can introduce a law. I think you can introduce a law that says two doctors have got to be satisfied that you are terminally ill, you have a specified period of time to, to live in their opinion, and there's no reason why you shouldn't be assisted 
to die. The interesting thing is that if you ask society in general about their views, you essentially get a report much as the YouGov report. If you ask clinicians, the numbers are reversed. Why is that? So about 70% of doctors are firmly against assisting suicide. And I think there are probably two or three reasons, but I'm just going to deal with one principal one. And that is that we know how complex and difficult and subtle is managing somebody as they engage and struggle with the issues around death and dying. I think there's an absolute moral reason why this is wrong. And that is I believe it is wrong fundamentally to require somebody else to kill you in your own best interests. Why? Because it is a moral hazard to you, the person doing it. And I do not have an entitlement under autonomy or any other moral code to actually say you are required to do that because I want you to. And in a sense, the question, therefore, that we've got to ask ourselves is, what's worse? Is it not to kill people who might want to die or to kill people who might want to live? Because once society allows this, it will then change the ambient culture and it will start to introduce obligations and duties. Um, people often say they don't want to be a burden to their families. Well, I bloody well do want to be a burden to my family. And actually, I want my family to be a burden to me. And that seems to me to be entirely what it is to be in a family and in a community. My problem with the way in which this debate is framed is not the conclusion. I think perhaps, probably, uh, Charlie Faulkner will have his way. The opinion polls seem to go that uh, way, and I suspect that'll happen. And uh, I'm not going to um, beat myself up and think that's the worst thing in the world. But there is a broader issue here which really does concern me. And the issue is something about the way in which the, the sort of individualism that we have in our society is now becoming, beginning to infect even the way that we think about death. There's so much about human beings and why we're important that's bound up with our vulnerabilities. Courage, love, care for others. That is not done in a world where everybody's immune from pain and loss. And I think the way in which we try and anaesthetise ourselves from pain and loss and suffering ultimately has a detrimental effect on our relationships with each other. What about the safeguards that you propose? You talk about people being terminally ill. Well, I'm afraid as a clinician, I can tell you, we can't really define who is terminally ill. Most conditions in medicine are incurable. Most conditions in medicine are progressive, and we don't know how rapidly they're going to progress. If you're thinking of predicting a prognosis, if you're trying to predict a prognosis of weeks, the margin of error extends into months or years. Even if you think someone's in the last 48 hours of life, you only have about a 97% probability of being right. 3% of those people, when you stop the treatment you were giving them, actually improve because the treatment was doing more harm than the illness, and actually they pick up again. If you want to have an accurate diagnosis, I'm sorry, but medicine is not that good at it. Internal coercion, I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to be a financial drain on my family. I think that's an internal pressure which is increasing. But if you have doctors do this, there is also an external pressure, which is if the doctor agrees to do this, then I must be right that my life is not worth living because the doctor agrees that I would be better off dead. Now, that may not be the case. It may be that that doctor just hasn't sought another opinion. This is not about very many large numbers doing it. In every place where it's happened, it's a small number, exactly the small number of people that Rob identified, who, despite every piece of wonderful palliative care that they're given, still want to take their own lives. And it's that group of people to whom this law is directed. And uh, if you look at Oregon, it's something like 85 people do it in a year in a population of three or four million. The question is, 
And I'm absolutely appalled by what Giles says, because Giles is saying that group of people who might be suffering terrible, they've got to suffer as an example to everybody else so that people care for each other better in the future, which I think is an extraordinary preparation for the church. And the way that you for and the way that you make people care for each other is by letting them suffer at the end of their lives. Suffering is a part of life. I mean, that's the whole thing that's so nonsense about your position, is the idea that you can somehow eliminate suffering from life. Suffering is an intrinsic part of human life. And therefore you've got to go through it, even if there are ways to bring it to an end. It is what it is to be human. It is what it is to be human. And caring for the human human is a part of that. You're a brute. <laughs> I, well, I got that. I'm, you're right about that. <laughs> People will talk about they, they want to be dead, they don't want to go on, they wish they could end it all, and some may even attempt suicide themselves and will then later on go on to say how glad that they are still alive, how much meaning their life has and they could never believe it. And there is this fluctuation that you see, actually, in most people who become ill, that goes between hope and despair. And it's part of the adapting process to illness anyway, and to the change in loss of health and potential loss of life that people are facing. There is necessarily coercion involved, because let me put this to you. Are you seriously going to be wanting to get a doctor to come and assess and evaluate you for assisted suicide who likes doing it? No, you're going to want a, a doctor who does it reluctantly. The word reluctantly means they're coerced into doing it. And one of our duties, and we can be hung up by the toenails for violating this, is not to do harm to people. And the whole decision about this is where defaults lie. You default to safety all of the time. And one thing I know beyond anything else, having practiced as long as I have, is that I don't know the future. I really don't. And I do not know how somebody's going to change, but I do know that when bad things happen to people, they usually change, and often as not, they change for the good. I'm not suggesting, therefore, that suffering is inherently a good thing. I'm saying that suffering as part of the human condition is the way it is. And generally, the older you get, the wiser you become because of all the bad things that have happened along the way. If we truncate that, if we amputate that experience from people, we turn them into robots. Yes, exactly right. Rob and Elora's, oh dear, doctors never know what's going to happen, which is what they're saying, nothing is certain. They're obviously right, but as they will both acknowledge in relation to the way that palliative care is delivered, in the way that medicine is delivered, you do have to make decisions from time to time, and generally they will be right. Yes, there may be occasions where they're wrong, but when you're treating a patient, you have to reach some conclusions. And I think it will be a very mighty decision in an individual case. People will be careful about doing it, but we should not step back from this on the basis it's just too difficult. Nobody can make up their own mind and doctors don't know what's going on. I think that's a completely wrong-headed way of looking at it. Those responsible for passing legislation look to see whether it is safe to pass the law and can see when they look at the so-called safeguards that it's too dangerous, you can't define things clearly enough and black and white to make it safe. In terms of the population out there, fear is certainly a major opinion former and those who go to church and her adherence to religion read the newspapers and watch the media just like those who don't and get the same information as they do and are understandably frightened by the stories that they read. The difficulty is the reality that we are working to provide is not newsworthy. So, for example, you don't hear the number of planes that land safely at Heathrow, but we would hear about one that crashed. If you look at palliative care patients' experience, we've got four years' data from across the whole of Wales, all specialist palliative care services, all scoring above 9.5 out of 10 on nine main domains repeatedly. 
No press interest in that whatsoever. The one thing I imagine the three of us share, that uh, Charlie Faulkner, and I'm making an assumption here, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, perhaps that's not the experience, is we've seen a lot, a lot of dying and dead people. Um, a lot of them. And I think we live in a society that's absolutely petrified of death and dying in a way we never, we, ne we never really used to be in the same way. I mean, you take a funeral and people will say these days, well, you know, I can't take my children there, it might frighten them, it might upset them, they can't see dead bodies. How many people, how many, I'd be very, very interested to do a poll about how many people have actually seen young people. Are these, can I just do it, are the, you front, are the young people at the front, how many of you have actually seen a dead body? So there's a very small amount. That would be that would that would actually be that would so that was just that would be much much higher 50 years ago. Be much much higher 200 years ago. And the reality is we're afraid of it. We live in all sorts of fictions, and we want to get it out of sight and out of mind. And I think what the lawyer wants to do here is put it out of sight and out of mind because doesn't realise that the reality of death is okay, and it can be faced, and it can be born, and it's okay. I think the spiritual journey, from my much more limited experience of assisting people and assisting people being with people when they are dying, is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a dimension that has to be focused mm -hmm. on. But both my experience in relation to it and other people who've spoken to me or written about it experiences, that the spiritual journey doesn't necessarily coincide with the physical journey. And the best example I can give of that is a doctor I mentioned before, Dr. Anne McPherson, whose death was described in very painful detail by her, do her daughter, Dr. Tessa McPherson, who's a consultant at a hospital somewhere in England. And uh, her mother had pancreatic cancer. She was fine for a few years, and then she got into a phase where it was obvious that she was dying. She went home, or she was at home. Uh, she, she, she had what her husband described as the best palliative care available. She said goodbye to her family. Everybody agreed that she was going to die in the next 7 to 14 days. And the death that her daughter describes very clinically was absolutely appalling. Now, in, she makes it clear, Tessa McPherson, that her mother, Anne McPherson, had there been a prescription available, she would have taken it. And the spiritual journey that she went on was, for the family, completely ruined by those last few weeks. What Elora said is so true when she comments on what Cicely Saunders said. The way that people die lives on in the mind of those who live. Thank yeah, you. Jonathan Romain. Um, I'd also like to pick up on the uh, religious aspect. Um, uh, uh, and I speak as a rabbi, uh, and also as a rabbi in favour of assisted dying, and part of a, a, a new alliance of clergy across all faiths uh, who, who actually think we can believe in the uh, sanctity of life, but also we don't believe in the sanctity of suffering. Uh, yeah, of course, as Giles says, suffering is part of life, but there's also a duty to lessen it as much as possible. So my question is, isn't it actually rather arrogant um, to deny that option to those people who are terminally ill and suffering and, and, and who wish it? And isn't it the, um, you know, the idea of keeping someone else alive so that you can keep your principles intact, isn't that very self-centred? If we think it is arrogant, then what on earth are we doing uh, legislating for doctors who don't want to do it, by the way? There's a handful who do, but most of us don't. And expecting us to do it, when actually what we should do is we should have a shelf in Sainsbury's saying, taking the following medicine will seriously damage your health, or making gas available, or something like that. So, cigarettes, aren't they? So every... <laughs> No, do, do, does it too slowly? Does it too slowly? Does it too slowly? Does it, and it's too uncertain. But you see, that's the problem of, of clinical care, is it's a bit uncertain. Um, it, it, and I'm serious here. Is, is that actually if we genuinely believe that this was a good thing for society, we should just legislate and say, this is available. That's where you go get the stuff. Um, and go get the stuff when you want to. 
um, to put it behind the laundry of healthcare and somehow make it okay, I think is disingenuous. And I think that's where the arrogance lies, is that society is not willing to take responsibility for itself. It's not willing to take responsibility for its individual death. It's not willing to take responsibility for the collective good and the fact that actually genuine autonomy and genuine choice is about limitation. It's very, very interesting that in, in the Middle Ages, uh, if you'd ask people how they wanted to die, it wouldn't be quietly, quickly, and in your sleep. It would actually be, take a bit of time. And the reason it needed to take a bit of time is because they needed to say goodbye to their families, they needed to say goodbye to their enemies, they needed to make peace with the world and themselves, and they needed to prepare themselves for death. We almost want to do it without noticing, without knowing that it's happening. Um, and that's a part of the reality that I think we're not sucking up into, into broader human life, that actually we are mortal and that we die. And I think we are in a game of let's pretend, of which assisted dying is a part of that let's pretend, which doesn't suck up as much of the reality of human life as I think we ought to. It's not that I value suffering, it's that I value human beings, and human beings suffer. I'd like to ask Charles, really. Um, I'm, he does make me very worried that once the floodgates are open, there'll be no stop in them. It's just like the abortion bill, when it was meant to be two doctors for not very good reasons, apparently. But now it seems to me as if it's an abortion on demand. So I think the same thing would happen with the euthanasia bill. Uh, you were worried about the floodgates. If you have proper safeguards and you compare what's happened in other countries, in particular Oregon, there are numbers. The numbers of people who will take their own lives will go up because it will become more possible to do. But the numbers in Oregon, as I've said, are about 85 or 86 a year. And it is something that, if it comes into law, will be something that is regarded as a very serious step before it can happen. So I don't believe that you should be worried about the floodgates. Going on to the, um, uh, the limitations, I think we have to understand that in Holland, they are looking very actively now at legislation for people ending their life because they're tired of life. Yeah. Um, and, that's, that, that, and they've already legislated for um, euthanasia in children. These are people who do not have legal capacity. So the proposition, and they've been managing people with euthanasia, with intractable depression and um, with dementia for quite some considerable time. So the idea that this is not going to bleed into a general proposition that there's a best interest called we don't want somebody to suffer because I think I see them suffering but they can't tell me back that they are, I don't think that's true. If we consider suffering tired of life, fine. Well, let's just make it available, full stop, and let... Let's not clutter it with medicine. Let's be real and take ownership of the responsibility we have in society. Suffering is bad. I totally agree with that. I spend my whole life trying to mitigate it. That's what I do every day. It gets me up in the morning. But do you know what? I think killing people thinking that you're going to solve the problem of suffering is worse. One thing that really struck me from the survey and the debate, actually, is that the people who, are, who um, want to see a change in the law are doing so on a very principled ground. Um, and yet, I mean, the debate here, those who are against, it's is more pragmatic than principled, I think. But not Giles, because you think suffering's good, that's your principle. Uh, so it does seem to be I said a debate. no questions, no provocations, just speak <laughs> the, uh, the principle that would have been on the other side, which was sanctity of life, we saw that in the abortion debate and the survey results. We've seen it here. That is less convincing to people. But there are very real pragmatic... I'm not saying pragmatic's bad. I'm saying there are very, I've heard from this. There are very real practical and pragmatic problems which people feel they need to overcome and they worry about the vulnerability. But that's not so much a principled objection. The principle seems to be on the side of those like Charlie who want to see a change in the law.